Uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning about how to interpret Scripture. Uh, really, because we have to. We have to as preachers. And so uh, I'm going to give you some, you know, you know, when I say rules, just standards, some things to, 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 uh, to go by. Uh, first one is very simple. Don't be objective. Now, we've made objectivity almost a god. Okay? Right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm being objective. You know there's some things you shouldn't be objective about? I think you should be objective. Uh, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> um, well, here's what I say. I am closed-minded on some things as opposed to uh, open-minded. You say, preacher, we should be open-minded. No, we shouldn't. Let me ask you a question. Will you guys be open-minded about whether Jesus Christ is God? No. no. You're closed-minded. You should not be objective. Now, here's what I do believe. I believe there would be a time when you are objective. See, the reason you close your mind is because you opened your mind to investigate. That's our problem. Some people close their mind and never investigate. That's the danger of being closed-minded. Example. Uh, I got saved in a church that believed the King James Bible. Uh, I was led to Christ by a guy that believed the King James Bible. Uh, and went to Dr. Ruckman's school. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this. Believes the King James Bible. And I, I'm sitting down in my first year, and I was off the streets, guys. I was in Bible college 10 weeks after I got saved, so I didn't come out of anybody's mold. Um, <clears throat> but I said, I said this. Uh, the guy led me. Christ believes the King James. My church believes King James. Ruckman believes King James. is teaching me. That's three of the worst reasons in the world to believe the King James Bible. So what would you do? Now, I don't say I threw it out. I say I set it aside, which means this. <clears throat> I should be able, if the King James Bible is Word of God, I should be able to take this belief that it is, set it aside, then take a look at all of them, and that's what I did. And you know what happened? It's kind of like that postcard he has where it threw all the others out of the ring. At that point, I closed my mind. Okay? There are some things you should close your mind. Should You should be open-minded about whether salvation is by grace. Okay, so don't be objective. Uh, now, I say this. <clears throat> you should be, uh, wait a minute, I wrote it down. Don't be foggy-minded. Oh, you should be this. This is good. Broad-minded as opposed to narrow. Say, so how does that mean? Well, I mean, you know when I meet somebody, I don't go through it. I say, look, uh, good to meet you. Could I ask you a few questions to see if we're going to be able to fellowship? Because <laughs> that ends up, you're not going to be able to fellowship. You should be broad-minded. I try to be broad-minded. <clears throat> My wife is always getting on me. Quit looking at her. Well, I'm trying to be... Anyway, um... <clears throat> But broad, broad, you know what broad is? Broad is, broad is this, as opposed to this. Guys, I am, I, I, I read everything. I am absorbing everything. I've got my mind working all the time. I, I'm as broad-minded <clears throat> as I can be. But on some issues, I am closed-minded. Um, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, 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 we talked about that. Oh. Some years ago, I think it was MacArthur said, <coughs> uh, it was the uh, death of Jesus Christ, not the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and everybody went, whoa, heretic, heretic. Why would you do that? Because somebody told you it was the blood of Christ. Why don't you open your mind? I see now you're worried, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Where did we get that it was the blood of Jesus Christ that paid for our sins? Okay, then if it's really in the Bible, shouldn't we be able to take that and set it aside? And then do this. Every place the Bible says blood, put death. You know what you'll find out? It doesn't fit. There might be some places where, where death and blood can be synonymous, but there are some places where it's blood, nothing but blood, can't be anything but blood. And you know what will happen to you guys? Instead of believing it's the blood for three, the three reasons, the three verses they gave you in Bible college and you never looked at another one, you'll have 20 then you can close your mind on whether it's the blood or the death. See what I'm saying? And most of the reason we don't open our mind up, uh, we say we're open-minded. Yeah, you're open-minded to modernism and everything else, but you won't open your mind to even what you're supposed to believe. <clears throat> uh, the Trinity. Look, I'll show you something. The Trinity um, is a word. We have a doctrine on a word that's not found in the Bible. Right? And what's the greatest verse in the Bible on the Trinity? 1 John 5, 7. And what happens to that when you claim it? Somebody says it doesn't belong there, right? Then, then look, if there's a trinity, don't you think we should be able to say, do this? Here's a trinity. Here's what I was taught. I didn't say what I believe. 
Here's what I was told. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to check my final authority on the matters of faith and practice and see what it says about a trinity. First off, the Bible calls it the Godhead. Since it is there, I have no problem calling it the trinity. If, you don't, if that bothers you, you know, like, like people don't say rapture because the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible, then call it the blessed hope. It's still there. But I'll show you one of the greatest verses. What if you had to teach trinity without using 1 John 5, 7? Go to Revelation chapter 3. <coughs> Revelation chapter 3. Now, at the beginning of this book, <coughs> who is talking to John? Yeah, well, who? Give me a name. We have a name for him, right? Jesus. Jesus Christ is doing the talking, correct? Okay, keep this in mind. So here's John. Jesus is talking to him. Who is he of the Trinity? Okay, you're doing good. You're doing it all by yourself. <laughs> Look at verse 21. To him that overcometh will I. Who is that? Who's doing it? Who's the I of this? Jesus, right? Okay. To him that overcometh will I, the Son, Jesus, grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Is that the Son just telling us that I am sitting in the Father's throne right now? Well, who else happens to be in that throne? Then that means the Father and Son are what? Oh, wait a second. That's a, that's a duet. We don't believe in the duet. Fortunately, we can keep reading. Verse 22, he that hath ears and ear to hear, let him hear what the, what? what? Sayeth unto him? Who's doing the talking? Wait, 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 who's doing the talking? But he just said, I'm the what? But he just said, I'm the spirit. So, what do you have? You have Jesus, who is the father. He, and when he's talking, he said, it's the spirit, which means I have one who is three. The father, the son, and the spirit. Now, that thing I set aside I can embrace with far more scripture than I ever did before. And I close my mind. So what's that mean? That means when the JW comes and he says, you just need to, won't you at least open your mind and examine this? No, I have. Your problem is you close your mind because you're afraid somebody won't fellowship with you if you ever open it. And, and then you have to anathematize anybody that disagrees with you. You should open it, study it, and close it. All right? So don't be objective. Um, once you do, okay, how about this? <clears throat> is the Bible perfect? Buddy, that's, that's a hard one. That is a hard one. And you believe the Bible's perfect. You believe that book is the absolute word of God. Okay, <clears throat> then, then once you've decided it is the absolute word of God, close it. Close your mind. You say, why are you telling me to do that? Because somebody's going to show you a verse you can't explain why it's in there. That's true. Somebody's going to show you a translation that you know isn't right or doesn't seem right. Okay, so the second thing is, assume, I know the little analogy, assume the Bible is correct. They say, you mean assume? Well, if you look, if you believe it, all right, when I say assume, when I say I'm going to set the Trinity aside, I go to my Bible, I come back with the Trinity, I now have established it. So if somebody shows me something that might look like there's no Trinity, I've already done what? I've already closed my mind. After I examined, I was objective. You should be objective at the beginning. You know, these, these, uh, these guys here, they need to be objective. These young guys, they need to be objective about what they're, they're sitting here, and they're hearing us tell them what to believe. They need to be objective and set it aside and come to their own conclusions. But you guys that are 30 and 40-something, what are you doing still scratching your head about your doctrines? You should not be scratching your head. Don't say, well, I'm just trying to be open-minded. Well, close it. You do it on everything else. <clears throat> so therefore, when somebody comes and says, man, I can't tell you how, you guys, you know, somebody comes up and says, uh, well, what, what about this right here? And that sure doesn't look right. I could show you some stuff that would make you doubt the King James Bible. <laughs> okay? You say, well, why then what? Because everything that I saw, it, it affirmed it is it, and I've closed my mind on that subject. That's why when somebody comes to your, it, up to you and says, well, pastor, this and this looks like a contradiction, and you don't have an answer. So what do I do? You, it's not what you do. It's what you should have already done. You already assumed that the Bible is correct. But that's after you've examined some things. All right, remember this. <clears throat> once, you, once you assume the Bible is correct, protect the text. So what's that mean? That means don't run to the Greek. 
Don't run to another manuscript. Don't say, well, Dr. So-and-so says that should say this. You ought to say this. I, am, I, I don't understand why this is like this. Guys, if you, look, if you think you're going to understand the Bible, you better have holes in your hands. You are not going to understand the Bible. You can't understand. How could an infinite God write a book and a walking, talking dirt ball that bad enough were, were dirt, but we only use 10% of our dirt to think? And then you go, well, you know, I think that might be a mistake because I can't understand it. Well, I can't understand it. I say, glory to God. I had a guy tell me, he said, well, you know, I can't understand God. I said, guy, guy, I said, come on, is this not true? You had your parents figured out by the time you were 12. There is not a guy here that ever went to his dad and said, you know, my stomach hurt. I don't think I can go to school. You know what your old man said? Shut up, boy, go to school. You, that's why you never went to your dad. Well, who'd you go to? Yeah, well, honey, you just stay home. And because and, I'm baking cookies, yeah, I think cookies will help. <laughs> but you know what else you never did? You never went to your mom and said, Mom, I've got homework to do tonight, but the guys are having a ball game. Can I do a homework after ball? You, listen, you get in there and you do your homework. Who did you go to? You went to the old man. Well, son, homework's important, but hey, get out there and play. You can do it when you come home. <laughs> so here's the thing, guys. If you had your parents figured out by the, by the time you were 12, why would you want a God you could understand? If I could understand God, you know what I'd know? There is no God. He exists right here between these two ears. Guys, I don't understand. You're never going to understand it, okay? So what do you do? You investigate. I don't mind if you throw the Bible out. I don't I take that back. I don't mind if you set the Bible aside. Do your own investigation and say, you know something? I've decided it. Robert Dick Wilson said this, and this is paraphrased, but he said, when you begin to investigate, be it blood versus death, be it the Trinity, be it whatever, mid-tribulation and rapture, and you say, he said, when you begin to investigate something, he was talking about whether, whether it's the book. He said, you're a little bit afraid. You know why? Because you're afraid you're going to find out you're wrong. He said, then you start investigating, and you find out that those three reasons they gave you in Bible school were nice, but, but now you are exhilarated because you've got like ten reasons instead of three. Okay? So once you establish it, open your mind, discuss the subject with yourself and God, then close your mind on it. Okay, now you've assumed the Bible is right. Then if somebody shows you something in, in, in the text that you can't explain, say, I can't explain this, but I know it's right. Amen. And here's your problem, Pastor. You're afraid if you tell your people this, that, that they will say, well, I, then I'm not believing it. Guys, I got an email from a Korean this week. Asked me a question about Greek translation. I had to give him one uh, on a Greek translation that is, not a, that is not Greek justified in the King James Bible. And all I could do is give it to him, and here's how I closed it. You can accept this or not, but this is the best I can do. And he came back. I'm, I'm thinking, he is going to say, how could you dare say, right? And he came back and said, thank you. That answered all of my questions, and, and, and that helped me. It's, it's the heart, okay? But, but see, here's what you're afraid of. You're afraid that you, because you don't have a, a firm enough line on every single verse, there's times you have to say, I'm sorry, this may not, this may not, satisfy you. That was what I used. I said, this may not satisfy you, but it's the best I've got. And if he writes back and says, well, I'm leaving the King James over this, I'd say, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. Then remember this. No man is God. I, I came to this conclusion <coughs> when I was a PBI. Uh, I'm studying under Dr. Ruckman, and I came to this conclusion my first year. If he can teach the Bible without making a mistake, if he's not wrong somewhere, he is God. And I could tell he wasn't God. Now, now, let me tell you what your heart will do when you say that. Okay, then I'll find out where he's wrong, and I'll correct it. And I'll be God. Right? That's exactly what we think. So here's what I'm telling you. Somewhere, something I teach is wrong. You say, why do you say that? Because if, if I teach everything 100% right, who am I? Come on, who am I? And you know I'm not. And the best part is, I know I'm not. <laughs> okay? Then he's going to say, uh, no, please, please, when you discover that area where I'm wrong, shut up. I don't want you to come. Yeah, I found it. I found it. Were you trying to make me God? <clears throat> so, so um, this is it. Uh, you, you ought to open your mind. Here's what I do, believe it or not. I have, I'm 40, 42 years ago, I graduated from Bible college. I've done some others since then, but... Um, Somebody says, what about this? And believe it or not, there's stuff I studied in Bible college that I have never confronted in my life. 
in my personal ministry. And when somebody says, what about this? You know what I say? Here is what I was taught in Bible college. I don't know for sure. I have not done a personal investigation on this, but I'm going to give you what they taught me there. Others I'll say, they say, what do you do about this? I say, here's what I was taught in Bible college, and they were wrong. Here, and here's why I think, and I give them my personal investigation. Or I say, here's what I was taught in Bible college, and I set it aside, and I did my personal investigation, and I've got five times the evidence that it was right. We are allowed to have our teachers be correct. But guys, remember, no man is God. You will never, there's not one person here that's ever going to teach the Bible and not be wrong somewhere. Now, if you just went paranoid, oh, I need to find out. I need to find out because I don't know how to teach the Bible anymore because I might tell somebody. Just give it up, pal. Yes. Amen. Give them the best you got. But that's why you've got to study. That's why you've got to be in that book. Now, as far as interpreting some scripture, um, these are pretty simple. But, uh, but they're, they're, they, they are, uh, they're worth listening to. <clears throat> Interpret. There's no dot there. Okay. Uh, Interpret the difficult by the simple. What's that mean? That, I'm simple. That means what I say, I'm right. Just, just listen to me. Don't be objective. Just if I say it, it's right. Okay, oh, I'll give you an example without, without even going to Scripture. Is it wrong to kill people? I'm talking about murder. I'm not talking about capital punishment. Is it wrong to murder people? That's what you say. Did you ever look at the Bible? Well, before you get too scared, yes, the Bible does teach that. But then here's what happens. You watch some soap opera on your TV where the, the, the couple's been married for 60 years. She has her stroke. She can't control her bodily functions. She can barely eat. She can't get out of the bed. She's shaking like this. She looks at her husband and says, if you love me, you'll kill me. Get me out of here. And he kills her. That's a difficult situation, isn't it? Right? And then you start like a woman. Well, you know, the quality of life instead of quantity. Hold it, hold it. I said, it's a difficult situation. What do you do? You interpret it by what? What's simple? How's Absolutely, brother, that's exactly it. Thou shalt not kill. Doesn't get any simpler than that. Correct? All right, I'll give you a couple. Uh, uh, I'll give you a couple. Here's, and here's a problem. Uh, imagine you're going to put a road through. You're an engineer. You're going to put a road through. <clears throat> and you've got to go 50 miles or 100 miles. And you send, your, you send guys out, and they survey it and everything else. And they go, can't be done. Why? Well, there's two valleys. Uh, there's two valleys. We can't put a road through here. Okay, isn't that exactly what 10 of the spies said about the promised land? They said, oh, there's giants. And two guys said, they said to the other guy, are there giants? Yep. And we shouldn't go, should we? Oh, I think we can take care of a couple of giants. I think we can take care of a couple of valleys. What I'm telling you is, I mean, you, okay, salvation by grace? Come on. Yes. Well, I just want to let you know, guys, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. <laughs> so what are you saying? I'm saying that's the difficult one, but the simple one is, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You, in, you interpret the difficult, and, and when somebody starts with, when, just, just watch yourself. How many times have you gone to some place, uh, and you thought everything was fine, and the guy says, now you think that's fine. And then he muddies the water, and, and then he, show, he sells you a water purifier. <laughs> right? Hey, I mean, you know, uh, you like your water? Yeah, I drink water all the time. Let me show you what's in your water. And you see bugs in your water coming out of your sink. And then, see what I'm saying? So beware. When somebody has to, when somebody has to degradate the other side before they start, that's how these guys did with this, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this courting thing. The first 20 minutes was why dating is bed hopping. And you listen to it, and you went, whoa, I don't want to do that. And then they give you something that was nowhere near Scripture. I had one guy, I heard him, on the, the, the guru said, well, this is new, and my 16-year-old daughter is helping me with this. I want a doctrine that a 16-year-old girl helped me with? Please no. All right? Let's take a look. <clears throat> uh, interpret the difficult by the simple. How about eternal security? You believe in eternal security? Yeah, yeah you better. But I th is it real? Is it in the Bible? Then if it's real, you should be able to set it aside, go to the Bible, and let the Bible reaffirm it. Um, I'm not going to go too long on this, but in John chapter 10, verses, well, let's just go there quick. John chapter 10, verse 27. 
I'm in New Zealand. I'm talking to a shepherd and uh, after service. And he came up to me and he says, uh, he, I can't remember what kind of church he went to. He's saved, very, very much saved. And he said, um, I just don't know about this eternal security. And I said, well, look what it says here. <clears throat> uh, being a shepherd, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which, is, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man can, is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. All right, first off, it says this. My sheep hear my voice and what's it say? Next three words. Matthew chapter, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 22, 23 says to the people, I never knew you. I said, when you get saved, God knows you, right? Then if you lost it, he could never say to you, I, he could say, I knew you one time, but I don't anymore. Right? That's not what he says. He said, I never knew you. You know what that means? That means he can never say, I never knew you. <laughs> okay. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Just do a little study on perish. It is hell. If you are saved, you can never perish. And then this one, I was talking to a guy one time. I said, um, uh, my father was given to me is greater than I, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I said, you've heard it, you're, we're in the father's hand. And I'm talking to this holiness guy or Pentecostal or whatever who thinks he can lose your salvation. I said, Doc, you're in God's hand. I said, he said, can you fall out? I said, don't stand near the edge. I had a guy say this, can you jump out? I said, you get near the edge, I'll push you out. <laughs> but okay, okay, let me ask you a question. Here's how I answer that. We're in the Father's hand, right? Where's he? In heaven. So if you fall, jump, or are pushed, where will you be? Yeah. On the floor. <laughs> but when they sweep, they will find you. <clears throat> but all I'm saying, guys, is that once you establish that, once you establish... Uh, 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 eternal security, close your mind when somebody shows you a verse that might show you could lose your salvation. But see, here's, here's your problem. It is that first step. Your problem is you say, I established this because in my third year Bible class they gave me two verses. And I dare not wander from that because number one, I'd actually have to think and study the Bible and couldn't study my golf swing. And number two, if I do, if I do in, in, in investigate this, I might not get on the Alumni Association. The Bible better be above the Alumni Association. Uh, here's one. Uh, go, to, uh, go to Leviticus chapter 23. Get Leviticus chapter 23, Numbers chapter 27. Oh, get, well, you better start with Luke. Go, go to Luke chapter 22. Uh, you know, we're not going to be able to tell you what, you, tell you what uh, Hilton, why don't you get uh, 2 Chronicles? You know, I, I got a problem with my, my uh, I think it's 35. You get 2 Chronicles 35. Tim. Uh, would you get Second Chronicles 30? And uh, Brother Jerry, would you get Numbers chapter 33? So you go to Numbers 33, you guys go to Chronicles. We're going to uh, we're gonna go to Luke. I get so tired of this. I get tired of it from, from, from the guys that believe the book. Look at verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is the Passover. You know how many times people have said, well, see right there, all seven days of the Passover. I don't see that at all. I don't see that at all. But that's what they're saying. And some of you think that. You just won't say it. So let's just say this. This is the difficult passage. This is a question. What are we trying to find out? What does the word Passover define? Okay, Leviticus chapter 23. Let's see if we can get some, some simple teaching. Not what your school taught you. Not what your favorite preacher thinks. Even though what I think is important. Um... Leviticus 23, check this one out, verse 5. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Any question about what the Passover is now? This is the seventh month. You've got to check it out. It's in the seventh month, and it's the 14th, I'm sorry, the first month. It's the 14th day of the first month at even. That is the Passover. That is as clear as it gets. What's after that? And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, under the, Lord, uh, under the Lord, seven days, you must eat unleavened bread. Now, I'm going to give you this heads up. And there, this is why God did this. I don't know. But there's times when the first month and the 14th day, it's called the Passover. But if you would read your Bible, you know what else you find out it's called? It's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
There's time when the 15th, first month, 15th to the 21st, it's called the days, plural, of unleavened bread. But it's also called the feast of unleavened bread. You say, those two overlap. Yes, they do. How do I know which is, one is which? Read your Bible. That's a terrible thing to have to do. Study the context. <clears throat> so this tells us that the 14th day of, of, of the first month is the Passover. The seven days after that are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Days of Unleavened Bread. Look at Numbers chapter 28. And on the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. Very clear. And on the 15th day of, the same, uh, uh, of this month is the feast. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, uh, uh, shall unleavened bread be eaten. Again, very clear, correct? Okay, Brother Hilton, you have Second Chronicles chapter 35, right? What's verse 17 say? All right. Do you see what he just did? It separated the Passover from the feast. Do you understand that? Brother, what's your, oh, uh, uh, you're in 30. Look at verse 5. Read verse 5. Second Chronicles 30? Okay, go. Okay, read the next verse. Oh, hang on, hang on. Try 15. This, this is me reading my notes. There. Okay, now they kept the second month. That's the only place in the Bible that I found where they keep it on the second month. That's because of Numbers chapter 9. Read the first 10 verses and you'll find out why. If a guy wasn't clean to keep it the first month, he was allowed to keep it in the second. They weren't clean. They wanted to keep it. So they kept it in the second month. It's the only place. But if you don't read numbers, somebody will show you that someday and say, see, the Bible says, you say first month. There it is, second month. You've got a mistake. But they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, or second month, correct? So it is the 14th day. Now read verse 21. Notice there's six verses between this, guys. That's called separated. Go ahead. Okay, they kept the Passover on the 14th and the 15th through the 21st. They kept the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they were, they were separate. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think it's Exodus 34, verse 14 or 15. Check that out sometime. And that's where the seven days are, are mentioned without a mention of the Passover. Because they are, they are separate feasts. They just happen to be separated by 24 hours. Well, I think they're all eight days. Who cares what you think? Because Jerry is going to blow you guys all out of the water. Look at Numbers chapter 33, Brother Jerry. Look at, read, read verse 3. Good enough, that's right. Hang on, he said they left on the 15th day. And what did he say? On the morrow after the Passover. Then the 15th, the Passover is over. Say, so, okay, so you should know. Passover is the 14th, 15th, 21st, days of 11 bread. Somebody shows you number, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 22, verse 1. And it's difficult. It's unclear. No, you, you define the unclear by the clear, the difficult by the simple. It doesn't get any simpler than Leviticus 23 and Numbers chapter 28 and Numbers chapter 33. Right? All right, so you interpret the difficult by the simple. The second thing, the original languages aren't the answer. Not the answer. If it is, your people are in trouble. You know, you know the, 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 the phonies that don't believe the King James Bible? You know what they, what they really believe? When they say they believe the Bible's perfect and it's here, that God has preserved it, ask them where and they'll go, in the manuscripts. There's over 5,000 manuscripts and it's here. I said, would you get me a copy? And if you get it, you can't do anything with it anyway. They can't read it. Guys, you, if you've studied any kind of Greek, you, I, have, look, I have held some of those manuscripts in my hand. I can't read a thing. It's handwritten. You ever just read? You're, I have trouble with my own handwriting, let alone somebody else's. They're handwritten. There's no punctuation. The, the words are run together. Now, I believe this. If you kept looking at them and kept looking at them and kept looking at them, you'd understand that one. You'd get the idiosyncrasies of the, of the writer of that one, but it wouldn't help you with the next one because it's a different writer with a different style. All right? <clears throat> so, so the original languages are not a help. The fact that the manuscripts out there somewhere uh, are, uh, are the answer. That's not it. Uh, I'll show you. Look at um, Galatians chapter 5. I like this. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter, chapter 5. <clears throat> now you know that in Galatians, this keep it in context. Galatians chapter 5, some people came to Galatia and taught that they could lose their salvation. And Paul says this about the people that taught that. Verse 12. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. 
Get a good news from our man, read that one. I wish they were, I wish they'd go all the way and castrate themselves. I've wanted to say that a few times myself. Anyway, good news for modern man says they should go all the way and castrate themselves. <laughs> guys, uh, anybody from the South? Okay, you guys from the South, you have church discipline and you put somebody out of the membership that you guys say you churched him. We say that. But what they mean is they cut him off from the congregation. You understand? Boy, I, all I know is if, I, if they got if they got do church discipline on me, I hope they don't use the good news for a modern man. <laughs> and the only, thing, the only thing that could be worse than that is having gone to a church where they use the good news for a modern man and then joining a real one and go, you mean that's all that meant? <laughs> NIV says they should go, uh, they should, uh, uh, NIV says they should emasculate themselves. New American Standard says they should mutilate themselves. Okay? <coughs> you say, well, what does the Greek say? It doesn't matter what the Greek says. You want to study what the Bible says. Write these down. We do not have time to look at them. Uh, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. And it says they should be cut off from among the people. Leviticus 20, verses 3, 5, and 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, I have a note here that says Ahab. You have to see what that says. Uh, in Psalm 101, verse 5, a slander should be cut off. In verse 8, the wicked should be cut off. In Jeremiah, verses four, 7 and 8, it says you ought to cut off yourselves. So what are you saying? I'm saying you need to check out what the Bible says, how, how the Bible defines cut off. And it defines cut off as, uh, if a guy makes the, uh, the ointment of the apothecary, he should be cut off from Israel. Uh, if a guy does not have his child circumcised on the eighth day, he is cut off from Israel. You understand? And then you get the definition. And, and those translations, you know what really bothers me? What really bothers me is, where do these guys' minds dwell that when they see cut off? Oh, I know. Here's where, the, here's where it dwells. In Greek. Uh, same Greek word. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43, it says, If your hand offend thee, cut it off. Mark, 40, uh, uh, Mark 9, 45, If your foot offend thee, cut it off. John chapter 8, verse 10, If your ear offend you, uh, cut it off. Uh, eight, uh, 18, I'm sorry, 18, verse 10. 18, 26, uh, talks about a rope being cut off. Uh, that's uh, uh, in, in Acts chapter 27, verse 32. Remember the, the shipwreck? They cut off the, the boat. Say, so see, they cut something off. Well, yes, they did. But, but it's mentioned by name. So well, then what are you cutting off in Galatians? The offending person. You cut the entire person off. Don't pick a certain part that your mind is always dwelling on. Because of all the television that you watch. Uh, go to, go to um, here's the third one. Go to, go to Psalm 12. Check the context. Psalm 12. Guys, what is in Psalm 12 that we are so fond of? <coughs> Six. The words of the Lord are pure words, of silver tried in furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. All right. What's he talking about? That's what you've been taught. Okay, now, what if you don't believe the Bible and all them, all them, King James nuts keep going to those verses. You've got to find something. Remember what uh, the jury, they don't have to find the guy innocent. They only have to have a what? Reasonable doubt. Then, and what was it? Yea, hath God said? The devil never said, God told you in the day you eat of that, you'll die. But in the, the day you eat of that, it'd be something different. He, he said, yea, God said. He, first he put in doubt, then he gave another definition, correct? All right. Here's the, here's the doubt. Look at verse 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's not talking about the words of verse 6. That's talking about the poor people of verse 5. Twenty years ago, I was debating the Ken Barker, the head of the NIV committee, and I laid that on him. By the way, one of the reasons Doc Ruckman taught us Greek and Hebrew was not to in, enhance the Bible, open the Bible up, show the people that you knew something. It's basically, you ever hear that, the old Westerns, will cut them off, it's a pass. When we show them the Bible, where are they going to go? They're going to go to Greek or Hebrew. So he taught us to be there waiting. So I went to Hebrew. You say, were you looking for... No, I already... Doc, my mind's closed. I've already established King James the Bible's Word of God. I don't need Hebrew or Greek. But just incidentally, the Greek on that, or the Hebrew on that, is uh, third... 
person plural. What's third person plural? You say it two ways. They and them. That's what it says. NIV translates it, us and we. That's called first person plural. Okay? Do you know how many Hebrew manuscripts of, uh, of, of uh, Psalm 12, verse 7, have it in first person plural? I'll, I'll put them right here. Zero. None. All these guys that scream, the King James Bible isn't accurately translated, and then they would look at every single Hebrew witness that says they and them and change it to us and we. How dare you complain about the King James translators? How dare you? And I showed that to, to uh, he's sitting right across from me, uh, uh, Ken Barker. And, and the guy's really kind of twinky. I mean, I think he's the kind of guy, if he sneezed, he'd scare himself. And suddenly, man, blood through, went course through his veins. He leaned out and he said, well, I believe it's the poor. It's talking about the poor, verse 5. I'd never translate it that way. They and them. Oh, so what you're saying is what you believe overrules the original. Oh, hey, you know what? You, know, you ready for this, guys? Write this one down somewhere. Ken Barker believes that his English can correct the Hebrew. <laughs> That's what he did, right? He corrected the Hebrew with his English. He thinks you go, well, he's not alone. But wait a second, here's our problem. Our problem is, what if it is talking about the poor? Well, preacher, I don't believe it. Yeah, I know. But see, all, they can introduce a reasonable doubt, right? What do you do? Well, reading the Bible always helps. Look at verse 1. Help, you see, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of, of men. Now watch this. He's talking about godly people, and he's talking about wicked people, okay? Uh, the, the Hebrew word for, for the wicked, wicked is uh, democrato. Anyway. <clears throat> All right. Look at verse 2. Here's, look, look, if the, if the homosexuals say, we're going to get you guys, that's the wicked talking, right? This is what this is about. The wicked have said to the poor people, we're going to get you guys, you faithful people, you, the, you godly people, it isn't poor people, you godly people, you faithful, we're going to get you. And you go, uh-oh, good night, man. If you're going to cower every time somebody calls you on the phone and, and threatens you, sell ice cream. Okay, so here's what, the, here's what the ungodly say. The words of the ungodly are found in verse 2. Look, uh, they speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with, their, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. So in the second verse, there are three references to what? The words of the wicked, right? The wicked said, we're going to kill you, Look at verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that, that speaketh uh, proud things. In verse 3, there's three more references to the words of the wicked. In two verses, you've got six references to the words of the wicked. But don't stop. It's like you're allowed to keep reading. Four. Who, who have said with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? They're about to find out. So they're saying to the faithful and the godly nine times in three verses, What? let me ask you a question. What is the context of Psalm 12? It is the words, and it's the words of the wicked. And then God says, you want words? I'll give you words. I'll give you words. But my words are silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Six and seven are talking about the words. And I don't have to get scared when somebody says it's about the poor, and I better just say you're touching God's anointed, and don't ever question me, and I'm the man of God. The context makes it clear. Some of the questions you can't answer, you don't need anybody to help you. You just need to read your Bible. All right, <clears throat> how about this one? Oh, I, I need a space here.
clarification may be elsewhere. Now, I'm going to tell you something, guys. I got a Bible program. I got one on my phone. Uh, I read my Bible on my phone if, if my wife lies to me. 43 years married, she only ever told me one lie. Now, she's told it to me consistently for 43 years. She gets out of the car to the grocery store and says, I'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> I was 16 last time she said that. I came out looking like this. So what do you do? I grab my Bible in my, uh, on my phone and I read my Bible. But I read my Bible. This is what I read. Because God inspired a book, not a disc. He inspired a book, not a program. Don't you dare go around with your stupid laptop and your, well, I've got it right here and I put all my notes in here. Quit being so proud of your brain because it ain't that great anyway. All right? This is the book. Okay? And, and I'm going to tell you what happens. <clears throat> what happens is that you punch in a word into your computer. You know what's happened? Computers and Bible programs have made a bunch of lazy men think they're Bible scholars. You punch a word into your computer. You go mow the grass. While you're mowing the grass, your printer throws up on your desk. Now, you've got 500 pages with that word in it, and you think you studied something. You know what you did? You got a bunch of references you didn't need, and you missed every reference to that subject that doesn't have your key word. Uh, let, me, let me just show you one real quick. Uh, um, go to Genesis chapter 12. Now, this is off the top of my head, and as you can see, there's not much on the top of my head. Genesis chapter 12. Wait a minute, I might, have a, I might have a note on this reference. I just need to find a reference. In Genesis chapter 12, you know the story. That's where uh, Abraham has gone down into, um, got it, where he, Abraham has gone down into uh, Egypt. And I use this as the first one I teach on Antioch and Alexandria, points for manuscripts. Uh, I point that first mention of Egypt, that's in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Uh, and there was a famine in the land, <clears throat> uh, and Abram went down into Egypt. First time it's mentioned, to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. You say, well, what's the context of it? Is it positive or, or negative? Well, it depends on if it's you or your wife. Because <laughs> they're going to kill you and keep her. And some of your wives would think, you, if you told your wife that, she'd go, could we go to Egypt for a vacation? <laughs> but the fact is, <clears throat> it's a negative context, correct? And since clear back in 1990, some guy in Finland read the answer book, and he read that, uh, and he said this. Dr. Gipp, he, he deceived you. He showed you the first, uh, the first mention of Egypt as negative, but he wouldn't show you the first reference of Syria because it's negative too. Well, actually, I didn't, I didn't deceive you. I never checked it out. To be honest, I never checked it out. And then he gave it. Now, I want, you to, keep, I want to keep Genesis because there's something really super good here. But go to Judges chapter 10. And he wrote to this guy, and the guy wrote, gave me his material, and he said, he didn't want you to see the first time Syria is mentioned, because it's in Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria. Oh, guys, I'm not going to go any farther, I don't have the time, but it's obvious negative, right? And I'm cooked. But guys, I, I, see, I, I, call, I call computers lazy man's Bible study, because all you can do is, is your computer can check a word, and you remember before the computers was the Franklin? And, and that was back when it was all the Franklin. And I said, I, I, I just knew it. I said, this guy did not study his Bible. He did not read his Bible. He punched Syria into a Franklin, came up with that. And he, I don't know about a Bible program, but on, on the Franklin, if you punched in Syria, you found every reference of Syria. If you punched in Syria, asterisk, you got Syria, Syrian, Syrians, plural. Everything with those letters at the beginning of the word. So I pulled up my Franklin. <laughs> anyway, now I got a deep Bible question. Is Genesis chapter 12, uh, I'm sorry, is Genesis chapter 24, uh, 25, does that come before Judges? Okay, let's go to Gen Genesis 25. And if this guy had just put a little asterisk in there, here's what he found. Verse uh, 20, you know where Isaac, type of Jesus Christ, you remember what Eliezer, type of the Holy Spirit, is sent by Abraham, type of God the Father, looking for a Gentile bride for his son. And Isaac was 40 years old and took Rebekah the, the, to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban the Syrian. That's the first time the word appears. 
And it's not negative. It's, a, it's the son getting a Gentile bride. But that's not the first time Syria is alluded to. Look at 24. Chapter 24. Uh, he sends out Eliezer. Look at what he says in verse 4. But thou shalt go unto... What's he say? Come on. 24.4. Thou shalt go unto what? My country. So what is his... Okay. He said go to my country and he went to Syria. So what would his country be? Then look back to Genesis 12. Now the Lord, verse 1, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of... What country would that be? Not mentioned by name, but it's the first allusion to it. But you won't find that if you just punch Syria into your stinking computer. There is no better Bible study than read your Bible, 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 till you die or until you hear a loud trumpet. Um, real quick, look at uh, Exodus chapter 8. You guys uh, remember the, 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 the uh, ten plagues in Egypt? We did the video on this. But uh, it, Exodus chapter 8 was the, was the, uh, the um, plague of the flies, right? Oh, man, you guys are in trouble. You King James guys, anybody, you're all in trouble. You say, why? What well, do you believe it was flies? Because the Bible says so. Well, let's take a look. Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. Look at verse 21. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of, what's the next word? Is yours in italics? So is mine. Look at verse 22. I will sever in the land that day, uh, the land of Goshen, uh, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of, what's the next word? Oh, they were italic flies. They were all from Italy. Flies from Italy. Smelled like pizza breath. Look at um, verse 24. And the Lord did so, and, and there came a grievous swarm of flies. End of the verse. Swarm of flies. Uh, look at verse uh, 29. It's just about there, about third line down. Swarms of flies. 31, third line down. Swarms of flies. Guys, the word flies doesn't appear one time in the Hebrew. Flies doesn't appear one time. This is why. Can I give you this? I'm going to give you this, the, the statement as it should have been said. When somebody says, Rookman thinks you can correct the Greek and the Hebrew with the English, add this, the Greek and the Hebrew that we have. I believe this. If we had the original Hebrew, flies would be in every one of those in Hebrew. But the, but the Hebrew we have doesn't have it. Well, now we've got another problem. What else goes around in swarms? How do you know it wasn't a swarm of mosquitoes? How do you know it wasn't a swarm of bees? There is no way of proving, if you're going to pull italics out, and somebody's going to pull italics out, right? There is no way of proving from, from Exodus chapter 8 that it was ever flies, and we have a problem. And I ought to just let you go. And if I did, do you know what you should do? You should find out what your Bible says, but look at Psalm 78. I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to tell you this. Um... Psalm 78, verse 45. He sent diverse sorts of, what is it? Wow. Is it italics? No. But it was way later than Exodus chapter 8. We call this progressive revelation. Isn't it? You guys believe in progressive revelation. Oh, really? You don't? Because if you don't, start. Because it wasn't until, guys, Moses wrote Exodus. Who wrote Psalms? Most of them? David, that's there's a little gap in there. We call this the gap theory. <clears throat> so, it was, so what Moses wrote, as far as we're here, but he said, oh, but Moses put flies in there, but we didn't know that. And it was clarified here, and I'll give you the second reference, I'll give you one, it'll be done. Psalm 105, verse 31, it says flies. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah says it's not going to rain. How long did it not rain? I will give a $100 bill to anybody who can bring me anything in 1 Kings that shows that, that, that family was three and a half years. You guys just answered something and you got no authority from 1 Kings chapter 17 on it. You say, where, where does it say three and a half years? I'm not going to tell you. It was stated twice. I will only say this. We never found out it was three and a half years until like a man by the name of Jesus Christ. I'm, my, my reading is in 
it, it, it went through kings today. So wait, hang on a second. 925 years before Christ, there was a, there was a, there was a drought. And we never found out how long it was for almost a millennium. Till Jesus Christ told us three and a half years. I'll let you find out where he said it. And I'll let you find out the other reference to it. So what is that? That's progressive revelation. And the answer was found elsewhere. Now I'm gonna, I'll tell you what I recommend you to do. Number five, ask God a question, then read your Bible, and 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 read your Bible. And, your Bible, and, read your Bible. and one day God will say, hey, remember when you asked me that question? Yeah, I do. Here's the answer. Why didn't you give it to me 30 years ago? You couldn't, you couldn't handle it. Or you weren't reading enough. You were, too, were, you were worried about your slice. You were worried about your hook. You were about four-wheeling and snowmobiling. You should have read my book. You, I'd give you this a whole lot sooner. So, guys, that's it. Interpreting Scripture. And um, you don't need any man. You don't need any man. All right. Did you get something? Yeah. Of course you did. Amen. All right. Well, I believe the gals have got the food ready. Now, speaking of gals, most of our wives are out putting us seriously in hock. <laughs> Probably not. But, uh, by the way, um, we tried this the first year, 03. And um, one of the things we noticed is that about half of them don't even shop. They end up finding a place somewhere in the center of the mall and fellowshipping with one another. And what we found is that a lot of the gals are starved for fellowship with other preachers' wives. And so um, we've just had a lot of testimonies to the effect that uh, that was one of the things they enjoyed more than anything else. Now, we jokingly talk about retail therapy and, you know, going in credit card debt and bankrupt and all those other things. And, and maybe that's true in some cases, but I'd say for the most part, uh, the gals need and enjoy that fellowship. 